Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Michaela Williams and we'll be discussing advanced scheduling in Kubernetes. Today's presenter is Oleg Chernukin, CTO at Kubler. If you have any questions, please post them in the chat and we'll make sure to address them. Okay, let's get started. Uh, thank you, Michaela, uh, Michaela uh, for the introduction. Uh, and yes, I'm Oleg Chunichin, uh, CTO uh, at Kubler, and I'll talk about uh, uh, pod scheduling in Kubernetes today and um, um, basic uh, things you need to know about pod scheduling as well as more advanced topics on how it can be customized, etc., etc. And uh, before going there, I'll spend uh, maybe 20, 20 seconds talking about uh, uh, why we are talking about that. So uh, we at Kubler are building a Kubernetes management uh, platform for enterprises. So essentially a tool which companies can use to manage multiple Kubernetes clusters in different environments. Uh, uh, essentially, Ops team can use it to deliver Kubernetes as a service uh, inside of their organization. And, uh, well, uh, which this tool essentially is aimed to bridge the gap between cloud native uh, stack and uh, enterprise requirements, enterprise needs, and different groups of users in, uh, in, in the enterprise. Uh, so, uh, based on uh, core open source technologies, Kubler, uh, Kubernetes and uh, container runtime like Docker, uh, Kubler builds uh, various enterprise uh, components and uh, components necessary to centrally manage multiple Kubernetes clusters to operate it and monitoring, log collection, identity management, etc, etc. So, and given the nature of our work, so we also uh, deal a lot with uh, Kubernetes itself, of course, with uh, 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 making sure that uh, Kubernetes can be used uh, in various use cases and scenarios. And uh, this sometimes involves uh, um, quite a lot of uh, uh, customizations and uh, using extensively Kubernetes extensions, extensions features. So uh, some of our webinars are uh, talking about uh, things that we learned on the way, summarizing various ex extended Kubernetes features and this, like, for example, last week we uh, gave a talk about RBAC on Kubernetes uh, from basics to advanced usage. So, and this webinar is talking about scheduling in Kubernetes. So, I'll, I'll, I'll just give a very quick uh, Kubernetes overview, so how its architecture tent works. And then we'll talk about how scheduling works in Kubernetes, uh, what controls are available to end users, operators, developers uh, in terms of scheduling, uh, what advanced scheduling techniques you can use, and then uh, look at a couple of examples, use cases and recommendations, uh, very generic, uh, on how uh, scheduling can be used more efficiently. So Kubernetes. So, uh, you probably are familiar on a high level with the architecture. Uh, I'll just uh, again, give a quick overview. So Kubernetes is a container orchestration, distributed container orchestration, a system which uh, manages uh, multiple so-called nodes uh, on which uh, Kubernetes intends to run or users using Kubernetes intend to run multiple containers. So uh, Kubernetes adds a notion of pod uh, which is essentially a fixed group of containers and pod in Kubernetes is a unit of scheduling. So essentially you put a pod onto a node to run one or more containers. And uh, Kubernetes uh, follows uh, this idea of uh, target state and state reconciliation. So you provide Kubernetes with the uh, model of how your application should look like. So I want to run five pods of this type, 10 pods of that type within those constraints. And Kubernetes tries to solve 
this request and tries to bring actual system state uh, aligned with your requested system state uh, within the given constraints. So and this is very important notion uh, because uh, scheduling uh, is a big part of what Kubernetes does. Uh, so how it solves those constraints, what constraints you can define. So this is all part of today's presentation. Um, so first of all, uh, in terms of uh, Kubernetes architecture, so this uh, both uh, uh, desired state of the system is a model of desired state of the system is stored uh, as a set of objects uh, in, 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 in Kubernetes master API server, uh, as well as collected information about actual state of the system is stored there. So there is a single component, well, logically single component. This Kubernetes master can be uh, distributed as well for high availability reasons, but from the logical, well, logical standpoint, logical architecture, it's a single component to which through its API, user stock providing desired state of the system and uh, agents, Kubernetes agents called kubelets running on each of the worker nodes also talk to master through API, uh, providing information about actual state of the system and getting information about what needs to be run in terms of containers on their uh, uh, corresponding nodes. Uh, there are also other components uh, such as Kubernetes controllers, uh, Kubernetes scheduler uh, that work with API and that implement various processes inside uh, within Kubernetes clusters. Like scheduler, for example, is exactly the component we'll be focusing on today. So it's a component which looks at current state of the system, uh, desired state of the system in terms of which containers runs where and adjust uh, or provides additional information to uh, uh, within that model to tell Kubernetes and kubelets which container needs to run where on which node. Then I will look at this process in, in a little bit more details in a few next slides. <clears throat> so right after you start your Kubernetes cluster, so it's essentially empty. Kubernetes master doesn't have any objects. Uh, in, in its database, uh, kubelets haven't yet contacted Kubernetes master. So the first step after cluster startup is that kubelet connects to master and tells master that, hey, I'm running on this node of this type with these characteristics. This node has this much RAM, etc., etc. So uh, my, a, 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 a node object is created as a result in uh, the master database. So next step usually is user or client of Kubernetes cluster who wants to run uh, certain containers or pods in Kubernetes lingo uh, on the cluster. So user or client creates a, a number of pod objects in uh, the master database. There are more details to that in terms of that. In most cases, you don't create pods but you create controllers like deployment or daemon set, etc., etc. But eventually it results in creating a number of pod objects uh, that are not assigned to any node yet. So objects are there, but they sort of exist in a vacuum. They are not assigned to a node. So uh, this is where Kubernetes scheduler picks the process up. Kubernetes scheduler constantly communicates to master API. It notices that hey, there are new pods that are not assigned to any node. Let's deal with that. So, and scheduler uses quite a <coughs> uh, smart algorithm using a number of heuristics and rules to associate those pods to certain nodes and we'll look uh, add that algorithm in a few of the next slides and <clears throat> provide this information to Kubernetes by uh, marking which node each pod is assigned to in pod specification. And uh, so this gets noticed by kubelets. So kubelet 
if you remember those are agents running on each node they are also in constant communication with the master they track <coughs> I'm sorry. They track uh, which pods are assigned to their corresponding nodes, and if they see that there are new pods assigned or some pods uh, are deleted, so they, kubelets, perform corrective actions. They start pods that are assigned to their nodes as Docker containers. They can stop pods that are uh, deassociated from the node or deleted, and this way desired state comes into agreement with an actual state. So Kubelet also reports current status of those pods, whether they are running correctly, whether they failed. So user can see this state of the pod through API again and uh, react accordingly. So uh, now we'll look at this stage of the process when uh, Kubernetes scheduler decides which node pod needs to go to. So essentially uh, on a high level, uh, scheduler follows a so-called scheduling algorithm. So for each pod that needs scheduling, it first does filtering nodes. So it excludes nodes on which this pod cannot run for any reason. Uh, then uh, for the leftover nodes, it calculates node priorities and if uh, there are nodes uh, still available in the set. Uh, scheduler uh, puts that pod on the node with the highest priority. So uh, the first uh, thing scheduling algorithm does, yeah, goes through node filtering. So and the first group of filters is a volume filter. So according to uh, uh, volumes, persistent volumes requested by the pod. So there are a number of constraints that can be uh, related to volumes. So for example, if a pod uh, requests a volume in a certain availability zone, uh, that pod can only be assigned to nodes in that availability zone. Uh, if Kubernetes or scheduler knows that not, no more than certain number of volumes can be assigned or associated, attached to a specific node and this number is already at limit so it will also not consider that node for scheduling uh, mounting vo mounted volume conflicts so for example if two pods request the same volume so they and that volume can only be mounted to a, uh, a one node uh, so those pods would have to go to uh, the same node uh, and some other constraints we'll talk in more details uh, a little bit later then resource filtering, so those filters are related to resources. So scheduler considers if the node has enough resources uh, to run this pod and uh, if there is a resource pressure condition on a node. Uh, next set of filters relates to topology. So uh, there are a number of constraints that you can specify as a part of pod specification uh, that constrain the set of nodes the pod can run or uh, is, uh, have a preference to run on. Then after uh, this set of nodes, initial set of nodes is filtered and reduced to smaller set of nodes on which the pod can run in principle, uh, scheduler uses a number of prioritization heuristics and rules and uh, selects a single node with the highest priority according to those rules and that is the node where pod can be run. So if no nodes are found where pod can be run, so pod will hang in an unschedulable state essentially. So this is one of the things uh, that, so as, as, as if you trying to start a pod and you see uh, that it is not getting scheduled, uh, it stays in uh, pending state. Uh, you should look at events and status of that pod. Usually scheduler explains there why it couldn't be scheduled. So for example, there are zero nodes with required resources or there are zero nodes with no tains that this pod can tolerate, etc. Et so we'll go through several uh, things that 
affect the scheduling algorithms in the next few slides. <coughs> so first of all, it's resources. So uh, there is a set of uh, resources that ports regularly use and uh, standard set includes CPU, RAM, disk space, uh, but there can be also custom, not custom resources in terms of custom resource definition, but uh, additional resources in terms of what resources ports can use. So for example, GPUs uh, uh, available on nodes are considered such custom resources by Kubernetes. So, and each pod can, or actually even each container inside of the pod, uh, can provide information to Kubernetes about how uh, much of this or that resource it requires at the very least. And can also provide uh, information about uh, limits for those resources. So uh, for scheduling purposes, uh, we are only looking at requests, uh, requirements. So those are uh, tested against available resources uh, or as it's called allocatable resources on a node. So if node has at least uh, as much allocatable resources as the pod requests, this node uh, is able to host that pod. So you can see allocatable resources and full capacity of the node in node object status section. Uh, pod requests are specified in container resources section. So next set of constraints and requirements are related to volumes. So I already mentioned one consideration that is taken into account whether a volume is in the same node. So essentially, if a pod requests a volume that is in a certain availability zone and volumes can only be assigned within an availability zone, which is the case for AWS EBS volumes, for example. So that pod can only be scheduled on nodes in that availability zones. So another consideration is uh, attachment limits. So in Azure for certain for example, for certain node types, you have a limit of how many uh, disks you can associate with the node. And if that limit is exceeded, so pod requesting volume associations cannot be uh, scheduled on, the, on, on that node. Uh, volume location conflict. So for example, if you have two pods scheduled already on different nodes uh, and with uh, certain volumes attached, uh, you might try to schedule a pod which wants to use both volumes, but because of the current situation, uh, because of the fact that those uh, volumes are already attached to different nodes, this pod cannot be scheduled to any of the nodes. Uh, and the last part for volume is uh, actually um, um, declarative volume topology constraints. So volumes can uh, uh, provide node affinity as a part of their association uh, of their specification, which 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 uh, declaratively specify on which nodes those persistent volumes can be used. And this constraint also is taken into account by the scheduler. So uh, next set of constraints is uh, constraints specified as a part of pod specification. And the simplest of them is host constraint. You can just put a node name into pod specification and that pod can only be uh, scheduled on that node. Uh, so scheduler will not, will not look at anything else, if, if possible, of course. <clears throat> Uh, it's possible to specify a label and node selector. So uh, you can label nodes. So for example, you can have certain nodes labeled with a label tier value backend. And then you can use that label in pod specification to tell scheduler that this pod needs to only be scheduled onto the, that, that node group. This is often also used when you have different types of nodes, for example, nodes that have GPU for data science loads and nodes that have uh, advanced or enhanced uh, IOPS uh, characteristics. 
uh, can be used exclusively for uh, your cloud native storage um, pods. So the last uh, declarative uh, element of uh, or type of con of constraints that you can specify is taints and tolerations. So in a sense, taints and tolerations work as an opposite of labels and node matching. So you can mark node with a taint, and this means that only pods that uh, positively declare that they can tolerate this specific taint can be scheduled on that node. So this is often used to declare some uh, conditions. So for, if for some reason, for example, code uh, node becomes unusable, it gets tainted automatically and pods cannot be scheduled on that taint uh, unless they are clearly marked. So if they are, for example, are system pods that actually need uh, needed to run on that node to resolve that condition, so you can use this approach. So uh, a little bit more details about taint structure. So unlike labels, they uh, uh, have um, uh, a bit more parameters. So essentially uh, taint has key and value, uh, just like label, but toleration uh, allows you to specify a little bit more. So you can specify uh, effect in particular, you can specify operator, whether this pod should tolerate only taint with a specific label value uh, or it should just tolerate the taint irrespective of the value. And uh, you can uh, specify an effect, whether it's completely exclusion from scheduling or if it's no execute. So essentially that means that it can work only at scheduling time, but if the node gets tainted after the pod is already scale scheduled on the node, it will not affect uh, the, node, the pod running on the node. And then there is a, an effect called prefer node schedule. So it means that this uh, toleration acts not as a requirement, but as a preference. Uh, you can also specify a time limit for uh, toleration for no execute taints. Uh, next uh, uh, parameter that you can use to specify uh, on which nodes uh, pod should go is node and interpod affinity and anti-affinity. So well node affinity is what it sounds like. You essentially can specify that this pod uh, is required or should be preferred to be executed on certain nodes according to label matching, uh, according to specified node selected. So it is essentially an extension of uh, this node match selector, uh, but with the difference that you can use preference instead of requirements uh, with different weight. So, uh, and as a part of uh, this node affinity, uh, you can use either simplified, um, it's actually the difference is with node selector uh, license flexibility, uh, you can uh, with uh, uh, selector terms used in affinity, uh, you have a bit more uh, operators that you can combine uh, and you can even actually uh, use uh, greater or less than uh, comparisons for label values uh, in those uh, match expressions, which which expands your capability, uh, your abilities uh, when you are using uh, node affinity versus uh, node selectors. So interpod affinity and anti-affinity is uh, even better. Uh, um, tool to specify constraints on your application uh, topology, deployment topology. So unlike node affinity, uh, interpod affinity is untied from 
your infrastructure layer. So with Interpod Affinity, you can define rules like I want these uh, types, this type of pods of this type to be distributed over as many nodes as possible or as many availability zones as possible. Or you can say that I want pods of this type to be, if possible, uh, collocated with nodes of that type, with pods of that type. So unlike node affinity, with pod you have both affinity and anti-affinity. So affinity tends to collocate pods, uh, anti-affinity tends to distribute pods of the specified type. So, and this is done through this structure, which is similar for affinity and anti-affinity. So you define a uh, label selector, uh, which uh, essentially specifies uh, matching for that rule. And you specify a topology key. So essentially a label, a name of the label that Kubernetes should use as a uh, to, 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 to uh, find whether pods are collocated or distributed. So essentially, if you use a host name label here, so uh, pods will be distributed across hosts. If you use availability zone label here, uh, it will spread pods between availability zones. So, and this is an example of how uh, affinity can be used. So if you, for example, have this uh, kind of affinity rule with topology key tier and match label group A. So essentially now, uh, if you have a some pod running already on a node with tier labeled A, uh, another pod with the same label group A will be will have to be scheduled on one of the nodes also marked uh, tier a this is how requ required uh, pod affinity works so preferred is similar but it's going to be preference versus uh, requirement um, and then the affinity works similarly clearly so this uh uh, also, co this covers uh, the set of uh, things that, that you can specify declaratively, uh, and the rest, a uh, few more slides, are um, dedicated to uh, some customizations that you can do through cluster uh, cluster configuration. So this includes uh, changing uh, default scheduler configuration, having multiple scheduling schedulers in, in, in the cluster and exp extending uh, scheduler capabilities through a custom webhook. So uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, scheduler is, is just another component running inside of your Kubernetes cluster. And just as any component, you can change its configuration. And one very basic thing you can change there is to use a different algorithm provider. So there is a default algorithm provider which uh, tends to uh, spread pods as much as possible across different nodes. So essentially, if you schedule pods using default provider, even if you have a lot of uh, resources on all your nodes, uh, they will tend to go to different nodes. Uh, with cluster autoscaler provider, uh, the preference is different. So with cluster autoscaler provider, a scheduler will by default try to bin pack your pods. So it will try to put them as uh, new pods onto nodes that already have most uh, load, which helps when you use cluster autoscaler. Because in that situation, when, when, when your pods uh, uh, when, when your load in your cluster uh, uh, goes down. So due to rescheduling and eviction rules, it's possible to repack, repackage your pods to uh, nodes and leave some of the nodes unused so cluster autoscaler can uh, remove them out of service. 
So next, a bit more uh, fine-grained uh, configuration option is uh, providing custom policy config to a scheduler. And you can do that either through a uh, config map in your cluster dynamically or through a static config file. Um, and uh, that both config map or file contain uh, a configuration which looks like this. So there is a number of uh, predicates that are used for node filtering. And there is a number of priority calculators uh, that are used to prioritize nodes. Uh, remember, we talked about scheduling algorithms in one of the first slides. So you can customize parameters of those uh, predicates and priorities, uh, and uh, you can customize the set of those predicates and priorities. Uh, and the same mechanism can also be used if you build your own scheduler based on uh, standard scheduler code base. So, uh, so this is a more fine-grained way uh, to customize scheduler behavior. So, and the last, uh, most probably flexible but most complicated way of customizing scheduler behavior is uh, using external extenders. So you can essentially run a service in the same server or uh, externally uh, in the same cluster or externally and in the policy definition in the config file definition for a scheduler you can provide endpoint for that uh, webhook and uh, scheduler after using its own algorithm and going through its own steps uh, will consult that external webhook for additional uh, filtering and prioritization rules. So uh, I included in this presentation a, a slide with a number of references, links, where uh, you can find more information about all of those options. So uh, this is essentially a very abstract uh, representation of the API that, that scheduler webhook needs to provide. So essentially it's filter call, relatively simple filter call. So scheduler will give the hook a pod it tries to schedule and a set of nodes it works with. And uh, the webhook will provide filtered list back. And then uh, the same about priorities. So it will give pod and list of nodes and webhook can return priority list calculated for those nodes. Uh, you can also run multiple schedulers. So uh, I, if you noticed in the previous slide, uh, when I uh, included uh, scheduler configuration options, there was uh, an option called uh, scheduler uh, name. So by default, uh, standard scheduler runs with the name default scheduler. And this is the scheduler used for pods that don't specify which scheduler to use. But you can also run your own second instance of scheduler uh, with a separate identifier as a name, used as a name. And you can specify uh, that scheduler name as a part of your pod spec. Uh, and uh, in that case, that scheduler will be used to schedule this pod. And this is very useful if you are testing or debugging your scheduler or if you have uh, uh, different requirements for uh, different types of load in terms of scheduling them. Uh, uh, and the last probably option for customizing scheduling behavior is building a custom scheduler. So you essentially can take a standard Kubernetes scheduler as a reference point and it's probably the best route to follow. And then from logical perspective, uh, the implementation looks like this. So in an infinite loop, regularly you check the list of nodes, the list of pods, find pods that are still pending and unscheduled and that have scheduler name assigned to your scheduler ID. And then for each pod, calculate target mode and uh, create a binding object. Uh, and from, from that point, Kubernetes will take, take over and uh, 
kubelet will, will do actual execution of the pot on the specified node. This is a little bit naive implementation because it's uh, a suboptimal uh, because in larger clusters requesting full information about all nodes and pods in the cluster can take a long time and a lot of resources. So a better way of imp implementing it uh, would be creating a model of the cluster sort of in scheduler memory and only watching uh, changes on nodes and pods uh, and updating its own cache with that information and recalculating scheduling when necessary. So uh, just a couple of potential use cases where uh, what we talked about can be useful. So for example, uh, distributed pod, you have a database, uh, clustered database, and for obvious reasons you want uh, instances of that database distributed uh, across as many nodes as possible. So you can use pod anti-affinity for that database uh, to make sure that um, pods are spread. So if it's required anti-affinity, so you won't be able to run uh, database with three instances, for example, if you only have two instances in your cluster, if it's a preferred uh, anti-affinity, uh, so uh, that will be possible. Uh, so it all depends on your specific requirements and expectations of the target environment. So another example, I already mentioned it, so it's collocated pod. So for example, you already have those database instances distributed across multiple nodes, and now you run a different group of pods, uh, an application, and you want, if possible, to run those application pods as close to database replicas as possible, if again that's possible. So you can use pod affinity, and that may be preferred or required again as well. And depending on how uh, this whether this works in your specific requirements. Another example can be, for example, setting up reliable service on spot nodes. You have a uh, or spot instances. You have different node groups. One node group is, for example, in your data center and is considered more reliable than another node groups which runs on spot instances in, in the cloud, for example. And spot instances can um, can go away without... Uh, uh, so with, with very, very short notice, essentially. So and you want to implement scheduling rules uh, in such a manner that at least two pods of your application run on the fixed group of nodes and the rest then can go to spot nodes. So... Uh, Unfortunately, with, with standard scheduler, uh, there is no way to implement it for the same group of nodes. So you may have to develop either custom scheduler here or provide a webhook for a scheduler to implement a logic like that. Uh, or a simpler approach, maybe use multiple deployments, but then you would have to synchronize deployments for different groups. So very quickly, to look at what we talked about and certain do's and don'ts so that we learned over uh, last years. So one of the uh, main uh, rules about uh, scheduling is, well, first of all, make sure that you use, so you rely on the simplest uh, scheduling constraints possible for your application. So if you can just live with specifying resources, use those and leave everything else to Kubernetes. Uh, in more complicated cases, if you want to use topology constraints, try to stay with uh, just pod, uh, interpod, affinity, anti-affinity constraint and use uh, linking to node properties or labels. Uh, as a last resort uh, because that would require more uh, adjustment of your application to specific environment by operators of, or DevOps team who deploys your application. So this is again very uh, summarization of 
key takeaways uh, that we intend to uh, that we'd like uh, people to have from this presentation uh, from uh, what things you can use to schedule ports and define scheduling constraints, what you should use, should not, should not use as a result. And uh, I think we are very close to our Q&A session. Uh, you can use uh, this slide when we uh, publish this presentation to look over maybe some even extra advanced topics that may not be directly uh, related to scheduling or just are in but but can be used for scheduling or uh, some of them are in alpha stage in kubernetes but will be uh, introduced in kubernetes as beta and ga in, in future releases uh, that can be related to scheduling as well so i wanted to summarize them here as well list of references that you may find useful uh, for further review and I think we are open for questions. <laughs> so we have a few questions from the audience. So we'll start with this one. For pod and node affinities, you said there is an option for preferred or required. Why would you do preferred? Again, so maybe uh, it's uh, it may be a convenient way of making your application uh, more elastic and uh, reducing requirements to the target cluster. So for example, yes, in production, you want your database instances, your three database instances distribute, distributed uh, among three nodes. But for development, you are okay with all of them running on one node because it's enough to make sure that your application works okay. So you may use a prefer uh, anti-affinity, preferred and anti-affinity in this case. Um, so another question we do have from the audience is how do you see advanced scheduling being related to app type? For example, stateless, stateful data science apps. Um, so they related in the sense that uh, some topology uh, it's it, 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 scheduling even more important for stateless uh, or stateful applications uh, because uh, for stateful applications there are more more potential for uh, various problems and restrictions related to where data is stored like for example, as I, as I said, uh, when I talked about availability zones, uh, there are additional constraints and restrictions uh, uh, related to how volumes, persistent volumes can be mapped to nodes and uh, those need to be taken into account and somehow mitigated uh, when you decide how you would deploy your stateful application. So and, and good understanding of scheduling is, is even more important for stateful applications, for example. Okay, and we have about one more minute for one more question. Um, do you recommend using an open policy agent to address issues? And can you do a sanity check before provisioning the app workloads on the pods? Yeah, that's that's a good point. I I didn't talk about open policy agent, but it's a very uh, flexible, very uh, convenient tool to define pretty much any policies in different areas. So, for example, you can use open policy agent as a, um, uh, as a way to uh, define custom scheduling policy for a scheduling webhook or for a, for a custom scheduler. So, uh, so it's 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 a good point uh, or a good alternative to developing completely, uh, so developing schedule, custom scheduling logic uh, in in Go, for example. So instead, you can rely on more customizable, more configurable way of doing that through OPA uh, policy language. So the last part of that question was, uh, could, you, could you repeat it? Uh, yes. So the last part is, can you do a sanity check before provisioning the app workloads on the pods? 
uh, yes so for custom scheduling it may be important uh, but uh, uh, by default in in, in those uh, custom scheduling options I, I talked about uh, custom scheduler option I talked about uh, they all have to rely on uh, the node object so it's actually possible to within the policy decision logic to call to external services maybe check some additional information about nodes you have and do other sanity check checks but uh, it's probably better to do it as kubernetes way so for example if you need to do that sanity check deploy a daemon set which uh, will perform that sanity check regularly and provide the result as a custom condition on the nodes so that information will then be available to your custom scheduling code for for use in, in scheduling decisions okay thank you so much oleg for explaining that um, we do want to say thank you for for joining today's webinar feel free to reach out with questions or topic suggestions at the email provided and we hope you can join us next time